I hope you haven't had enough of me because I want to spend the next uh, few minutes and I hope I can finish my story. I have a good story to tell within okay. the lot of time. Um, so I'm the program manager for computational mathematics. Um, I've been actually the program manager for this uh, portfolio for several years now. It's kind of like my, you know, I have, uh, I have certain ownership, I feel certain ownership towards this uh, program. And part of that is because uh, the goal of the program has been to uh, support development of mathematical and numerical methods for modeling and simulation of uh, complex uh, systems that are important. So I just put that complex system of, and you see that again, just like the program in Dynamics and Control, the, uh, the uh, scope of this program as far as the application is, is uh, it's rather broad. But um, one of the misconceptions about the uh, portfolio or the role of uh, computational math is that it's like a service department, like the way you sometimes think of math departments in engineering uh, schools, that you just basically provide the basic tools and basic ideas so that people can use them in order to understand better physics or better engineering. And I've tried to change that uh, uh, perception. And I've tried to change that not by asking my PIs to not pr produce any kind of tools, computational tools, that's not the case. I have very good uh, transition stories uh, to tell and boast about, but I have tried to put a little bit more, I mean, the, make the portfolio uh, focus more on the underlying mathematics of computation, computational math. There are four different areas here. Uh, Multi-scale modeling, I put the I put actually the arrow here, and I, uh, this is going to be an area uh, uh, increasing emphasis, uh, mostly because now I'm going to be looking at multi-scale modeling uh, mathematical methodologies in the context of materials. In fact, that's going to be the, uh, uh, basically that's a mirror topic right now we have in that area. Um, uh, the, um, Multi-physics modeling at this point, it just uh, sort of uh, basically is flat. Uh, not that this area is not important, it's just that it's flat, that's all. Uncertainty quantification, you were asking me about the $5 million question, I'd say, uh, give me that, and I'm gonna spend all on uncertainty quantification. This is one area that you're going to see that there is a lot more work uh, that needs to be done uh, people say, well, DOE has spent a lot of uh, money already in it. What are you doing? Well, in this case, I, I, I can uh, uh, focus it ba on the basic research aspect of it, okay? And I'll, I'll talk to you about this more. Uh, multidisciplinary optimization and control. The reason it has this upward arrow is that it's, uh, we have had this uh, 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 basic research <coughs> initiative uh, designed under uncertainty. What are the transformational opportunity for computational math? In fact, the, what the sli the, this slide here, it, it's basically the slide I've been using to, uh, for the, um, in order to uh, argue that why we need to have more initiatives, uh, what, and in fact, we're gonna have that in the whole idea of one of the new initiatives uh, gonna have, in uh, basically uh, design of algorithm, software, and architecture of computing system together. And the other issue also is that uh, with some of these uh, uh, emerging uh, computing system, we need to have basically a re, uh, basic, uh, revisiting, we have to revisit our algorithms because the algorithms that right now we have may, uh, are not gonna be working in the, uh, on the emerging heterogeneous architecture. I mean, kind of, and I, ha I have to actually go through some of this because and, then, and you see why because of this, uh, this kind of uh, challenges and constraints, uh, we need a paradigm shift actually. So more and more you've heard that, that there's gonna be constraint on uh, system power for these, uh, uh, whether you're looking at a pedal or, uh, well in this case would be exascale. Uh, slower growth in memory bandwidth and capacity, and there's gonna be cost of data movement uh, that's going to have, uh, between the, these two, it's going to have a great impact on the kind of algorithms that right now we have, which depend on basically uh, memory uh, and also uh, movement of data. Since there's going to be a, a slower growth in clock rate, there's going to be this move to concurrency of higher number of nodes and uh, 
threats. So the whole idea of parallelism here becomes very important. Uh, slower grade in uh, I/O bandwidth, and uh, and since you're uh, looking at this uh, computing system with a very large number of uh, um, <coughs> uh, like uh, threads and nodes and all that, there's going to be a, a higher risk of uh, failure. So in this case, you have to be looking at resiliency and reliability of your algorithm in order to, ca to ca account for uh, this kind of failures in your uh, computing system. Because they have shown that, in fact, what happens is that uh, if you don't take that into account, the, the algorithm that you have is going to uh, diverge and will give you a wrong solution. And you won't also be able to reproduce your results. Okay. So this is really the uh, This is really the uh, the argument I'm using that why at this point we really need to address these big challenges. Um, uh, DoD funding in computational math is rather limited. The, my counterpart at ARO, I mean uh, Dr. Uh, Joe Mai, uh, he has just a small program, and there isn't anything else uh, like it. And I think this is really the place right now and time for us to put uh, more investment in this area. The argument the also I'm going to be making is that the uh, computational math, it's, it's a solid basically discipline in applied mathematics. And you're going to see just because we have more computing power, that doesn't mean all of our problems are going to be solved. That's not the case. More analysis is needed. We used to have, I mean, when we had the applied an analysis group, uh, program with Dr. Nachman, we actually, all our PIs talked to each other, and that was a very good uh, uh, interaction. So for example, for the multi-scale problems, we we're talking about multi-scale both in spatial and temporal. You have to keep that in mind. It's not possible to resolve all scales. So no matter what, you have to be doing some modeling. And you know that about turbulence modeling. That's why you have all these different techniques for LES and all that. So in this case, uh, there is going to be some mathematical modeling for passage of information across scales. Okay, so this is one major uh, math problem. For multi-physics problems, I've, I've said that before too. Just, be, just because you have good models for individual components, that just doesn't mean you can put them together and you get the right model. In this case, proper interface information is incredibly important. And again, that goes back to um, analysis, to mathematics. High dimensional problem. All the problems we are looking at, the problem are going to be high dimensional. The curse of dimensionality is, is, is just there. Okay, so what can you do here? You have, and again, that's not going to be mitigated by just more computing power. That's something I like to mention. This is not something you can say, oh, you have, so we can just uh, forget about dim a higher dimensional problem. You need more mathematical modeling. You, you, you have seen in the past that uh, I have said that my answer to this is that you're going to be looking at reduced order modeling, basically more of a coarse graining of your model that can, uh, if you can do it in a more accurate and maybe efficient way, this is one way of doing it, um, or using more efficient and accurate uh, uh, s uh, solution methods, uh, and that's going to be the, the argument I've been using also for higher order methods, I get to that, but this is one challenge. Major challenge, <laughs> okay? Effect of uncertainty. That in itself also could be under this because if you thought this, the, uh, the deterministic problems like Navi's stokes, whatever, they are, they are high dimensional. The moment you putting the, the, considering the effect of uncertainty, that's, that's another, that's another dimension that you're adding here. And the thing about effective uncertainty is that this is not just a, um, let's say, a theoretical exercise for people who were working in stochastic PDEs a long time ago for them to now uh, start you know, <laughs> getting more funding. The, the fact is that you, more and more people have noticed, in fact, for example, in fluid modeling, that you need to consider uncertainty in your model. Otherwise, you're not even having the right model for your fluids. And that's specifically important. I mean, you can just say for turbulence modeling. What else? Effect of mesh and geometry. In this case, this is the heart of discretization. This is the heart of the algorithms. But what's happening is that this is very active area of research because bad meshes you can lead to a major inaccuracy. And you need to con uh, also for the kind of problems, application problem, we have to consider these complex geometry. And this is the other thing: scalability of algorithm. Okay. I, the focus areas. Uh, 
I'm going to look at the uh, support of higher order methods. It's so funny, I think I have not given a single talk without mentioning higher order methods. This is an important area of research, but I am actually in the process of looking at this because I think we have had some very good success stories. So I want to see how we can continue work in this area in any what fashion. Uh, I will talk uh, 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 a little bit about uh, the multi-scale uh, methods that I'm uh, supporting, and that's in the area of structures. This is an effort that, again, just to tell you that uh, different program managers and portfolios definitely talk to each other. This is an area that uh, David Stargell and I can definitely talk about because uh, this work here uh, is definitely relevant to his. And uh, uncertainty quantification. This is a major area, and I will talk to you. Two things. One is that uh, the Bayesian framework for uncertainty quantification, we have in MIRI now, 2012, in material science. And the other one is that design under uncertainty, now we have a BRI. So actually, this whole area of uncertainty quantification has spawned different research areas. Okay, higher order methods. I want to again mention what I mean by higher order methods are high order methods of accuracy, right? What we mean is that with lower number of discretization element, okay, we can get a better order of accuracy for our solution, a higher order of solution, okay. So what happens is that in the past, in, uh, in CFD, uh, most, of the, most of what is out there and uh, has been used, they are based on um, lower order methods that are mostly based on like finite difference methods and all. So what's wrong with that? For certain regimes, we have said that before, for certain regimes, things work really well. But for certain situation, for example, like, uh, like vortice shedding uh, uh, and, uh, and also turbulent flow, these have certain problems. And the one problem is, for example, numerical dissipation. For, I have shown in the past that, for example, when you have these uh, vort uh, vort uh, vortice uh, shedding, if you're looking at lower the methods after a certain time, uh, you're going to uh, lose uh, resolution on these. Um, the other important thing is that it's also the, uh, the time integration, right? So you have a dynamical system that have spatial component and also the evolving time. So the time integration method is important. So if you use, and this is an issue, that if you use explicit method, because of restriction you have, CFL restriction you have uh, for stability, you end up having severe time step. Okay, so what it means is that then you have to choose your time steps so small, then it becomes extremely difficult, it's expensive to do your time integration. So what do you want to do? You want to have higher order of accuracy. Uh, in both time and space. Great, we know what, what we need, and we have been supporting work in this area. But why is it this is still an active area of research? Because there's no free lunch here. Problems, there are issues with these higher order methods. They're not as robust as lower order ones, okay? Sometimes convergence is going to be very slow. The issue with time integration techniques is that, yes, explicit methods are going to be too expensive, but implicit methods also can be a uh, slow. They're more accurate, they give you more efficiency, but they can be, uh, they, uh, they need speed ups. Um, the other issue also is that uh, a lot of the stuff, uh, for example, just in, you know, the flows that you have shocks, um, if you're looking at some of these higher order techniques, you go, uh, so you have problems with strand discontinuity, there is going to be some issue, for example, uh, uh, about maybe too much oscillation. So in this case, uh, around the point of discontinuity for some of these techniques. So you need to have methodologies that, uh, uh, that are both accurate and, and robust and convergent for these limiters. Limiters is basically, uh, this is for the gradient of your uh, flow here. So as you can see, when you have a discontinuity, that can go crazy. Um, so I'm just talk very briefly about two of the efforts. They happen to be my YIP efforts. There are two very, uh, the two young and very promising uh, numerical analysts now that have been trying to deal with the, uh, some of these challenges here. Uh, first one is Per Per Olaf uh, Persons, the uh, the math department at Berkeley. And uh, one of the nice things about Perry is that he not only uh, is in a math department, but he also is very much in tune with aerospace um, uh, 
uh, uh, community, actually. So that's what I'm trying to say. So it's not just a, uh, just a numerical analyst. It actually really writes his own codes and, it, and, and deals with real uh, uh, problems. So one of the issues he's had is that when he goes back to uh, so to, to solving some of these uh, problems, uh, this is because it, actually I'm not showing you the great pictures as far as what he's been able to do. I'm just trying to say well, what the issue is. He's found out that the issue is, uh, one of the bottleneck is that in solving these, uh, when you're trying to use these implicit solved, uh, solvers, you have to um, use these large and very expensive Jacobians, right? Um, so how do you do that? So we have had different variation of this continuous Galerik. Almost everybody now is using some variation of this continuous Galerik method. So what he's tried to do is that he came up with a different uh, formulation of this continuous uh, Galerik, and uh, he calls it the line discontinuous Galerik. And the whole idea is that he would use this one, one D, like this, for example, this is a two D thing. So he has a one D uh, uh, scheme that are quite sparse. And he can actually do his calculation in 1D. And you can come up with the uh, Jacobians that are much sparser than the other ones. So that has had, that's a, uh, it's a major sig uh, thing as far as uh, speeding up his uh, code. The other issue also, some of these implicit methods is that, um, yes, maybe you can come up with the, uh, using this methodology with the sparse Jacobian. But for example, look at the second order Jacobian matrix. This is, this is a system you're trying to solve, okay? So this is A. In this case, maybe K21 and K12, maybe they are, both of them are sparse, but when you multiply them, they're not, the result is not gonna be sparse. So how do you try to retain the sparsity of, of, of this Jacobian here? Uh, uh, GMRES basically is a technique to solve these uh, linear is iterative me uh, method for solving the linear um, system. And he's found out that as, well, as, far, as long as he can use a quasi-Newton solves, he can use the, reduce the number of expensive Jacobian assemblies. And uh, in this case, his, uh, the cost of his implicit solve is going to be the same cost as an explicit, which is great because his implicit solve actually solver uh, is much more accurate. Okay. Now, the, uh, this is the other technique, and this is a variable order uh, 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 adaptation for unsteady flows. A lot of times you want to do use, you want to do, for example, mesh adaptation, right? And the way you're trying to do your mesh adaptation is try to adapt around the t uh, place that where you don't, uh, your error is going to be larger. So what do we mean by error, though? I mean, because so a CFD solution is a very, you know, it's a large uh, solution, uh, basically, look at this, millions of degrees of freedom. And it's very expensive to get a CFD solution. And then try to get your error, ba you know, based on the difference between that and uh, um, exact solution. In mo most cases, you don't even have that exact solution. So instead of doing that, what they're doing is that, well, you look at, what is it that of interest in some of these calculations? You're looking at forces, moments, they're scalars, okay? So you, and they're actually sometimes they're, uh, the output of your uh, calculation. So what you do is that you try, instead of looking at this uh, error in the solution, you're trying to look at the error in the output and use that so it's much less uh, expensive in order to do your error estimation and do your adaptation according to that error. So this is one technique. It is a discontinuous final element, uh, both in spatial and, and uh, time. So you can see that. In this case, you have this slab here. And you can do, in this case, adjoint-based error estimation. And he has gotten very good results for this. But he has also said, this is a, one of the nice things I, I like about these people. Uh, you know, they don't say, well, what they do is perfect. Because they know that instead of now, instead of solving a, a uh, actual problem now you have to solve an adjoint equation, but solving this adjoint equation is not going to be that uh, simple or it's not going to be that cheap. It's going to be expensive. So what are what can you do? Well, this is actually work that uh, uh, Chris uh, Fitkowski is now doing with uh, Phil Rowe, and he's uh, and uh, you can just see that the moment I saw that I said, oh yeah, that's Phil Rowe's uh, formulation that they have found out that in this case, problem reformulation definitely helps. Instead of 
uh, having your uh, normal variables, what you do is that you can uh, write your uh, conservation equation in terms of your entropy uh, variables. And these entropy va uh, variables actually, you find that the solution of the, the their solution to the adjoint equation. So you don't have to do so, uh, the adjoint equation. Once you solve the problem in terms of this entropy equation, you actually have your uh, um, uh, solution to the adjoint as well. So in this group, the output, uh, output adjoint. So, so this is what they've been able to do, and they have found out that using another way of basically formulating this output will give them an all-around uh, good solution. Okay. Um, I have really tried to see whether I could have a, a for more like a national initiative in support of higher than methods, but that in, uh, required uh, interagency collaboration that has not been very easy to do. So in the process, I've just tried to see what I could do. One of the, this is actually a very nice uh, success story, that we, for the, uh, we had the first meeting, we supported the first meeting in a workshop on higher the CFD methods. This is very similar to the drag reduction uh, workshop that was, uh, t took place a few years ago. And in this case, we had about 80 global participants, different countries, 30, all these different groups. Um, 14 different test cases were considered. It's good to know, by the way, the majority of the people were supported by my program, so this was wonderful. So, and, and basically these different test cases, so this, uh, that was decided on, and people looked at different methodologies for solving these, and this is the conclusion, that for smooth inviscid and viscous flow problems, how are the methods that outperform? I mean, that's great. And also the kind of, tech, I mean, I told you just about solution-based grid and accuracy adaptation definitely helps with solution efficiency and accuracy. But when it still comes to Navier-Stokes equation with turbulence model, there's a lot of work to be done. And also, a lot, of, a lot more work on mesh uh, uh, generation, uh, higher than mesh generation. So that's like two areas that I'm gonna be focusing on in the uh, ne next year for funding. So this is an international workshop. The next one is gonna be in a couple, uh, well actually, well, my next, next summer, next summer in Cologne. And I have this uh, recent transition. I have uh, Suresh Menon from Georgia Tech and also PI uh, Marshall Berger, uh, who has, um, has had now uh, CAR 3D. This is a code that has been now uh, used by NASA and so many different uh, um, um, agencies and, and research labs uh, uh, the past few years. For uh, finite element methods now uh, for, for multi-scale simulation. This is a very interesting uh, idea here because when I looked at the uh, multi-scale simulation, especially in the context of structures and mathematical ideas there, I, I found that homogenization techniques are one that people have been using. But that's something that uh, uh, definitely relies on separation of scales. The kind of problem that uh, we are interested in, that separation of scales may not exist. So we cannot really use that uh, beautiful mathematical uh, work. So uh, in this case, um, uh, Dorothy from, uh, I forgot, it. I can't believe I forgot his first name, uh, from uh, Illinois, who's been also working with the RB uh, Structures uh, Directorate, has been working on development of a computational method. Uh, uh, for capturing this multi-scale uh, problem. And his idea is generalizes a finite element with global and local enrichment function. So let's see what that uh, supposed to be. He started with a linear case and now he's uh, uh, extended it to nonlinear problems. So let's look at it. So the, the whole idea here is that you can start with your general initial global problem, which is coarse. But then at the same time, you can have this local problem. And these local problems you can solve in parallel. And then you can use them to enrich your uh, uh, problem. So one of the nice things is that, so in this case, there's going to be a two-way uh, interaction between your local and your uh, global. But also, this is parallelizable because the local problem can be solved uh, uh, independently of uh, what you do here. So in this case, uh, you use your information at the uh, simulation step, so you build approximation step for the next step, okay. And you can use coarse finite element meshes, so that's the nice thing about it. So that really reduces the cost that you have. 
And he's been able to apply it to a simulation of a 3D propagating crack. And I like that. He's now using his technique. He, does, he, uses, he calls it uh, fast. It's fast, accurate, stable, and uh, uh, transition. It's fully compatible with finer element methods. OK, now, uncertainty quantification. This is, uh, this is uh, I've had, actually, right now, I do have quite a few individual uh, uh, PIs uh, project in this. But this is really the main effort here. This is a mirror in 2009. It's led by Brown University. And I have PIs uh, from MIT, uh, from Cornell, and uh, Caltech uh, involved in this. The challenges are tremendous. I mean, we're talking about proper formulation of stochastic model. So that whole goes, goes back basically like basic, uh, uh, one area in uh, applied mathematics and applied analysis. How to deal with this high dimensional problem? Of course, proper numerics. We've, we've had a lot of good stories to sell about the proper numerics. The program supported development of uh, numerics for solving the stochastic models in the past few years to the point that now they become like the gold standard instead of the Monte Carlo simulation. But that doesn't mean that we, have, we are done with that because what has happened is that even though we have very good and accurate numerics for solving this problem, they still suffer from curse of dimensionality. So which means that we have to go back here and see how we can mitigate this whole case of uh, the high dimensional problem. Well, so one of the nice thing is that it's a multi-disciplinary uh, and definite uh, effort. So you have people uh, who look at the mathematical theory. You're looking at people who are developing these reduced basis methods. As I said, was another way of dealing with the, uh, the curse of dimensionality of these problems, and there, these are different techniques, whether it's adaptive and NOVA, I talk a little bit about that, and also about the Bayesian framework. This is something we have talked about in the past, uh, and as I said, we've been very successful in this, but it does not solve all our problems. And we even have some software that uh, people can use. What are the, so this is, I just wanna show you this. Look at this, this is in this case your, this is, I think, just a simulation of a uh, the heat equation here. You see that the uncertainty actually increases in time. Things get much worse as time. So in this case, long-term integration of this problem is going to be a major challenge, right? Because your uncertainty is, I mean, the problem, it seems like it's uh, blowing up. The other one is also the curse of dimensionality. This is just a, uh, that, um, this is just to say, this is number of evaluation for this problem. Of course, the nice thing about Monte Carlo is that uh, the rate of convergence is very slow, but at least uh, uh, the, um, uh, but it's independent of the number of uh, uh, simulation, I mean, uh, sampling, I'm saying, in this case. So in this case, this is, a, uh, uh, this is Monte Carlo, or there are all these other techniques such as quasi Monte Carlo, and whether it's optimized or worst case, full grid, sparse grid, all these different ideas. And you see that actually as the dimension uh, increases, you see that what happens here, the number of evaluation also blows up. So this is the curse of dimensionality is huge here. So one idea that has proved to be very interesting is the adaptive ANOVA, this is this analysis of variation. I'd like to put this here again to just say that ideas that in the context of let's say statistics and uh, other fields have been routinely used, now they come into a different uh, uh, discipline, like in this case computational mathematics, and suddenly the, the payoff is huge. I, hope, I, mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm sure that my PIs don't say, hey, we, we, uh, we discovered this. They're aware of it. But this is what is so nice about when you see that people from different disciplines start talking to each other. In this case, this is what, so the whole idea is based on this, that you have, let's say, a, uh, a function of, let's say, n dimension here. And you want to, this helps you with the hierarchical decomposition. So you have a multidimensional function. So what do you mean by hierarchical? So using this adaptive ANOVA, what you do is, is that you can group your, you, this, this is an exact, right? Because you have this term here. This is an exact uh, expansion. But like any kind of uh, expansion, 
it doesn't really help to expand it this high. So you want to truncate it. But what are you doing here? You're putting together all terms that are of uh, one, uh, one dimension, then two dimension, then three dimension, all of them together. So and then the question becomes that, well, when can you truncate in order to get very good approximation? Okay? So this is just one way of dealing with uh, a curse of dimensionality here. So they've been using that. I mean, in fact, this is a, uh, this problem that you, ha you have here is thermal convection in a closed cavity uh, with random boundary condition here. And look at this. So people have been using Monte Carlo. Look at the number of samples you need in order to get the solution. This is like 90,000. Sparse grid. Sparse grid idea is basically based on that you don't, you don't sample just everywhere. You sample it on, on specifically uh, specific uh, points. And there is some mathematical theory that what would give you the optimal sampling uh, in that case. Uh, so you see that, but still it's 18,625. But look at the ANOVA here. You can do this with 193. This is uh, it's not bad. This is uh, pretty good. Now, actually, I think I'm <laughs> I have some time here. Uh, so this is interesting. This is Bayesian framework for UQ, which is a new, new really framework for doing uncertainty quantification. And, and also I have to say that this is a framework that can be used in now a lot of application of interest. For example, we were talking, uh, told you about this MIRI uh, on uh, multi-scale modeling for materials. Uh, and one of the uh, research areas was actually uh, the Bayesian framework, which can be used uh, successfully, we hope actually, <laughs> uh, for uh, modeling of these uh, materials. Okay, so the problem set up is this, and this is what is, uh, so you have a, a very expensive deterministic multi-scale solver, okay? A lot of times uh, what you end up having with the uh, um, stochastic problem is that once you discretize it and you try to solve it, you're actually using a deterministic one. Um, you have limited data. If you have limited data, then uh, uh, your accuracy is going to be limited. So you have to definitely be make, make sure that whatever model you have, uh, you have some sort of uh, interval of co confidence or accuracy in this case for the model because your data is limited. The problems you're looking at could have uh, stochastic uh, discontinuities. And also the solution space is that you may have uh, multiple outputs. So you, don't, you don't necessarily have a single one. The techniques that people have used for solving some of these problems, for example, like you know, all this variation, like uh, stochastic collocation, uh, stochastic lurking, you know, uh, polynomial chaos, all of these. The problem is that once you solve it, you just get one solution here. But what we like to have is sort of like a distribution of these solutions. Okay. And the Bayesian approach will let you do this. And then you can build the surrogate surface. Well, the surrogate surface that you create may be, uh, so this is like a surrogate model, may not be accurate. Okay. So one of the things you, well, it won't be accurate. So one of the things you, like, you would like to do a refinement on this based on uh, the accuracy of this so that you can use, uh, for example, you can use the data collection in such a way that the surrogate surface becomes more accurate, be more uh, representative of, of the model. And in this case, you're looking at error bars for uh, statistics. So this is an interesting um, framework for uh, handling some of these uh, uh, multi-scale stochastic uh, modeling. Um, yes, again, to say that you see that you have used, we have used, in fact, a Bayesian uh, methods and, and all these other uh, areas. And now we are trying to bring it to numerical simulation of physics-based model. So you see that, and, and, and you see the, uh, uh, the payoff is going to be huge. And this is just a slide to say that this, uh, uh, these actually, uh, this methodology has now uh, led to, uh, there's a statistical uh, toolbox there. And uh, it's based on some of the uh, um, uh, tools that are already out there. For example, the BLAST basic linear algebra package or the scalable version of it. And this opt uh, uh, plus plus, I think this is something that uh, I think maybe Sandia already has, and they put it all together, and they have put this methodology, and now they have a free software that uh, you can uh, download and use, which is great. Um, 
Well, one last thing, just, I, I wanted to talk about that just to say, because we have this new uh, uh, BRI on uh, design under uncertainty. Now, remember all the stuff that I was talking about, it was just for modeling. We call it basically forward simulation of a physical system. Now imagine now you're looking at optimal control and design problem with uncertain inputs, okay? So this is like another level of uh, complexity that you're uh, putting here. And as far as computation, this is again becomes a very uh, uh, challenging problem. So what the idea here is that uh, since you're trying to uh, do some sort of uh, optimization of your technique, for example, here was a source inversion problem here. If you, uh, so in this case, the optimization problem, they require sampling of uncertainties, right? So you want to use these uh, sampling uh, methodologies in order to solve this. <clears throat> but uh, this expense is going to increase with sample size, right? Uh, <clears throat> the, the, this methodology. So what you try to do is use this idea of adaptive sparse grids. Okay. So in this case, you just uh, you you sparse. You, I'm sorry. You you choose your grids in such a way that you don't you don't sample everywhere. You just sample in certain areas that are important. So what is that? Since you're doing an optimization problem, you sample it in such a way that your optimization problem has a, a faster rate of convergence. Okay, so in this case, the, the, uh, it's like you know, we're talking about the output error. In this case, the error uh, uh, that would tell, help you with choice of your sampling point is going to be related to your optimization techniques. This is where these two different areas are coming together. And in this case, uh, adaptive sam uh, sampling has led to reduction in computing time by a factor of 15 to 20, which is uh, significant here. Okay, so future direction. Um, yeah, I'm going to continue support of higher the methods in multi-scale multi-physics, but I'm really at this point, I'm getting to a point I'm saying, well, we have had the very good success stories, but where is really the next step here? Uh, continued emphasis on UQ and VNV. I think uh, that's something that uh, there is a lot of interesting and uh, problems here with the high payoff. Uh, you ask, again, I want to put this, <laughs> this is my $5 million uh, problem. Lots of lots of uh, ideas uh, here that need to be explored. Um, so algorithms right now uh, for support of algorithms on multiple platform, I've had it through uh, basic support of some work, it's a STTR project uh, for GPU computing. Uh, I can talk about it more in, I guess, next year, once I, you know, they go to the second phase. Um, uh, scalability of algorithm for ultra parallel large scale is definitely an issue that I'm going to be focusing on. Data driven modeling and computation, all these Bayesian model in UQ, certainly you've seen, is very important. And again, you also see that, again, portfolios being so related to each other, this data driven modeling and computation is very much related to uh, some of the things that Dr. Durima talked about in DDDAS. And of course, also the, uh, uh, the impact of geometric discretization. Oh. So. Ah. OK, open for questions. A lot of the work that you have a lot of the work that you have described has implications both in mathematics and engineering, et cetera, and I was struck by the fact that just to take two examples, Duarte at Illinois and Zabaras are being supported, for example, at NSF. So the real question is, what are uh, interactions do you have with other agencies in general uh, in terms of meeting or how do you get together? Your area of research, and that also refers to the previous talks as well, are sort of universal in terms of their applications. Absolutely. So I'm interested in the efforts that you undertake to collaborate. I was also struck by the fact that you said that in organizing this international conference, it sort of ran afoul and you basically did it on your own. Could you expand on that? Because all of these students were supported by AFOSR, but there was a lot of money involved. Well, so this was, uh, so just for the last one, um, uh, 
Uh, this was also co-funded by a, a European agency, actually, and, uh, and also the uh, AIAA CFD uh, techn uh, technical committee. So um, about the first one, about co uh, co uh, collaboration and interaction with other funding agencies, it's very close. I mean, in fact, to the point that I'm always asked and I always go even on the uh, uh, review panels for the proposals. And uh, whether it's DOE uh, or NSF, these are the two major players, right? So very close interaction to the point that we go and check our PIs and see you know, who is funding whom. And so, so because, as I say, I've always said that I'm not the biggest player here. So, but at the same time, what is important is that uh, the Air Force needs its own computational math. So what has happened is that with a lot of my PIs, they, I would ask them to go and talk to people in the lab to address their issues. Like for example, Zabaras uh, will go and talk to people in RW to talk to their uh, UQ needs, for example, energetics. Okay, or he would go and talk to our materials people to deal with the, for example, answer. So this is this is the re, uh, this is. So I try to make my PIs very much involved. <laughs> you, uh, Air Force, uh, Air Force relevant problems. So that's one thing. So that differentiates. I always ask them. So if you're sending me a proposal, how is it different from the one you sent to NSF or DOE, especially DOE, because there's more. Uh, uh, but for the DOE is not interested in uh, CFD. Most of the work that they support and people are do, uh, well, CFD like aeronautics sector. But you know, of course, there's stuff like combustion, some that are interested or plasma. But again, the regime would be different. Maybe the particular application problems are different. But uh, there's a lot of lot of interaction to make sure that there's not much duplication. There's always going to be some. The good people get end up funding, getting funding from different uh, organizations. So, so I have just a, a couple of questions. Um, the, uh, I agree that the Air Force needs its own computational math. There's no question about it. Um, a couple of questions. W one is, um, notwithstanding the fact that the dimensionality reduction reduces resources, I was surprised on your slide four where you outlined your program, you didn't have any um, focus on uh, resource-bounded computation, so things that are limited by time, memory, computation, communications, uh, power, etc., which is a, which is a, a, a critical problem in the Air Force. Uh, second area I was surprised, or, or say, 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 sorry, encourage you to look at is you had the word complexity in your slide four, and you didn't really address it, in my opinion, it, other than maybe computational complexity, certainly yeah. throughout. But complexity um, is, I think, a much richer. Um, uh, mathematical topic and frankly operational topic and in particular I'd encourage you to take a look at for example um, in this last comment I encourage you to look at a couple of additional domains beyond the aerospace in particular ISR in terms of uncertainty uh, in which is a major problem um, again beyond mathematical uncertainty but related and secondarily uh, in cyber uh, in terms of complexity and let me just observe that uh, we traditionally in, in cyber have looked at just, you know, you mentioned petabytes and exabytes. That's really not the problem. Um, actually, commercial industry has been dealing with, with, with exabytes um, for, for a while now. Um, the challenge is, I think a word you, you did use as well, is, is complexity. So, for example, the dependencies that we have in our cyber systems are, more, for the most part, unmeasured, unmodeled, and yet they're essential to the successful creation of our system. So I guess I just encourage you to, to, uh, to yes, focus on aerospace, but don't forget other important um, Air Force missions. I did mention space, but right. certainly space, especially ISR, yes, and cyber as an important to me, and in the complexity, because I don't think, as I've seen in the portfolio, we're really not addressing that, and that is one of the biggest problems that I can say at the Air Staff we're facing right now. We don't have the models, much less the tools, yeah. for, for managing that kind of complexity. Absolutely. So just, just in response, uh, excellent point. I, the only thing is that my, uh, when I said this, uh, I mean, I know that I put complex Air Force system, but I have to say that uh, it's, it's narrower than that. So basically, the kind of problems that I'm looking at, are basically looking at in the context, like like physics based models. So that puts uh, so some of the uh, uh, some of the domains, basically application domains, are, are, are not addressed. Um, 
I don't, what I'm trying to say, I'm not, I don't have a pro program here on computational methods for complex system. Complex system is something I've been thinking about for a long time. In fact, I am really seriously thinking of collaborating with NSF to write a new initiative in this area.